Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about transphobia, and particularly British transphobia, and even more particularly, uh, transphobia in the British press. Uh, that's right, the UK press seems to have a problem with trans people. Now, the tabloid press obviously does, but since those papers are seemingly written by and for the absolute worst, most vile people ever to have existed on planet Earth, uh, that's to be somewhat expected. No, today I'd like to talk about that bastion of fair-weather progressivism, The Guardian, which, for all the blessedly non-British viewers out there, is our leading centre-left newspaper. Surely The Guardian can be counted on to stand up for minority rights a wrong person might say. And I'll quote here from an article written on the 2nd of November of last year entitled Why We Take Issue with the Guardian's Stance on Trans Rights in the UK. The Trump administration is trying to define transgender people out of existence. Last month, the New York Times reported that the US government is seeking to deny trans people the most basic recognition by claiming that gender is determined by the genitals that a person is born with. The leaked memo sparked outrage and fear about a policy that could cost lives and prevent millions of Americans from existing in public spaces. The Guardian in the US is committed to covering this important civil rights fight, but when the time came for us to report on Trump's attacks, we encountered problems. Some trans people wouldn't talk to us. That's because days earlier, The Guardian published an editorial that we believe promoted transphobic viewpoints, including some of the same assertions about gender that US politicians are citing in their push to eliminate trans rights. Guardian journalists in the US had no input in the editorial, which we felt was misplaced and misguided, and nearly all reporters and editors from our New York, Washington DC and California offices wrote to UK editors with our concerns. So then, the UK Guardian has been very naughty and has had to be told off by the Americans, how shameful. Now, the editorial that inspired this response is from the 17th of October and is titled The Guardian View on the Gender Recognition Act, Where Rights Collide, and is actually only one in a recent series of fairly rubbish, to put it lightly, articles about trans people from The Guardian. But we'll get to those in a little while. Uh, this particular article makes the case that, quote, Transphobia must be opposed, but misogyny too must be challenged. Gender identity does not cancel out sex. Women's oppression by men has a physical basis, and to deny the relevance of biology when considering sexual inequality is a mistake. The struggle for women's empowerment is ongoing. Reproductive freedoms are under threat, and the Me Too campaign faces a backlash. Women's concerns about sharing dormitories or changing rooms with male-bodied people must be taken seriously. These are not just questions of safety, but of dignity and fairness. Now, we're going to talk more about this article later, so I won't dwell on it too much right now, but with regards to the argument that cis women's concerns about sharing spaces with trans women must be taken seriously, one possible line of response does immediately jump to mind, and that's historical comparison. Consider an article that, discussing desegregation, say, made the case that white people's concerns about sharing spaces with black people must be taken seriously. Or responding to a gay rights issue with straight people's concerns about sharing spaces with gay people must be taken seriously. Now, I realise that there are people around today still making those arguments. I don't mean to make it seem like those issues are solely in the distant past, because they aren't. Anyone old enough to remember the don't ask, don't tell debates in the United States might remember a fair bit of fear-mongering about gay people in showers and locker rooms, for instance. However, it is hard to imagine our liberal pals over at The Guardian making those kinds of arguments today. Uh, they would, in fact, rightly condemn any politician that made those remarks. So why do we see them making the same arguments with regards to trans people? Is there something unique about the current situation, or is the comparison there a valid one? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we get to that, though, I'd just like to make a few things clear. Uh, firstly, I'm a cis man, and I am by no means an expert on trans issues, or anything else, actually, and nor am I trying to present myself as such. If I know anything at all, it's from listening to trans people, reading the things they've written, watching videos they've made, and talking to my trans friends, uh, some of whom helped me write this video, actually. 
What I'm providing here is a platform and a voice. I'm not trying to speak for anyone or claim I'm some authority on anything, because I'm not. And I'll include a list of videos by trans people in the description of this video that covers similar topics to what I'm going to be discussing today, but better than I can, so go and check those out. My aim with this video is to reach out to some of my fellow cis folk who might have unconsciously even absorbed some transphobic rhetoric from the bigoted mess that is the British press, or anyone who might have encountered some of these concerns about trans people out in the wild. You know, the people who might watch me, but who haven't heard a trans person say these things before is, I guess, who I'm aiming this video at. Now, to understand the conversation surrounding The Guardian's concerns about gendered spaces, however, and to avoid getting lost somewhere later and having to double back, uh, we're going to have to start out with some basic concepts here. And so we'll begin by asking a simple question. Uh, what makes someone a particular gender? And there's a lot of bad answers to this question, uh, so let's take a look at some of those. And first up is the most basic and crude of answers. What bits they've got. That's right, if you've got a penis and testicles, you're a man. If you've got a vagina and ovaries, you're a woman. So that's a direct one-to-one -one sex and gender correlation there. Nothing could be simpler than that, right? Now, my response to this genital-based answer is twofold. Uh, firstly, it isn't particularly helpful. Uh, speaking for myself here, but genitals tend not to come into play in the majority of my interactions with other people day to day if you can believe such a thing. Uh, I don't know what kind of lives you're all leading, of course, but I'm personally not peeking down people's trousers to confirm what they've got in there. It's an inconsequential, unknown quantity, the vast majority of the time anyway, and thus not much use to us. The other problem with this answer, in addition to it being unhelpful, is that it isn't actually true. Uh, before we even talk about trans people or questions of self-identification, Conflating gender with genitalia in an exclusively binary way simply doesn't work. And let's do a thought experiment here. Now, I personally have a penis. And you're just going to have to take my word for that, I'm afraid. Okay, so let's assume I have a penis. Say I'm out and about one day and get into some sort of unfortunate situation and it comes off. You know, a car accident, say, or some sort of misjudged boast. So now I've no longer got a penis, or testicles even, let's say. But that doesn't change my gender, does it? I'd still be a man, you know. We wouldn't all start calling me she because of that, would we? I'd still identify as and present as a man. I wouldn't have grown ovaries or something. You know, you hopefully see my point here. Accidents, injuries, diseases... You know, there's plenty of reasons why someone might have to, for instance, have something removed. And if that's the something we're using to determine which binary gender they belong to, we're kind of screwed there. Okay, so we'll leave that argument behind, and we'll go on to the next level. So, someone might say in response, I acknowledge that what genitals someone has currently doesn't actually determine their gender, but what if we say it's what genitals someone was born with that determines your gender? Gender is still tied to genitals, just not necessarily your current genitals, you see. This is the worrisome definition that we saw the US Guardian staff be rightfully concerned about earlier. Now, this argument shares a problem with the previous one. Outside of the person in question, their parents, and their doctors, not many other people day to day are gonna know what genitals someone was born with. So with regards to access to gendered spaces, unless you're planning to have people submit a full medical history in order to go into a public restroom, say, this way of defining things is similarly unhelpful. Another problem with this argument is that it completely ignores the experience of intersex people. Not everyone is born with sexual characteristics that neatly fall into one of two camps. There are some people born with ambiguous genitalia. There are people with both testicular and ovarian tissue. And on a genetic level, there are female people with chromosomes normally associated with being male, and vice versa. Now, obviously, this is a video talking about trans people and not intersex people, but I mention them here to show an example of another group of people who would be hurt by legislative attempts to define gender as a strictly biological, binary thing. Now, the response to mentioning intersex people is usually dismissive. You know, well, there aren't many of those people, are there? Uh, which is wrong for a start, because there's actually a lot more intersex people than you might expect. 
There's that fun statistic that estimates intersex people are about as common as people with red hair. Uh, regardless though, it wouldn't matter if there was just one intersex person on the planet, it'd still be a valid way of being a person. Ignoring intersex people or trying to downplay their existence is, in our case, a way to enforce a binary system where one does not apply. Because here's the thing about binary systems. There's only two things, not usually two things, but also the occasional other thing. You know, binary code is called that because there's just ones and zeros. There isn't like a, a five or an eight from time to time, is there? I believe bimodal is a more accurate term when talking about sex. You know, there's two general peaks, but there's fuzzy edges and outliers and so on. This intentional ignorance with regards to intersex people, you know, thinking that humans are supposed to fall into one of two binary camps and that anyone who doesn't is some sort of mistake who we can ignore for the sake of convenience, actually reminds me of the old creationist misunderstanding of evolution, oddly enough. As if there's some will that must be consciously designing humans to fit an ideal standard or something. Also, even if there were a practical way to use what genitals someone was born with to determine which gendered restroom they should go into today, efforts to enforce this rule would quickly lead to situations like the following. So this chap here is Michael Hughes, a trans man from Minnesota. Now, in response to so-called bathroom bills designed to force people to only use facilities that match their assigned gender at birth, Michael Hughes posted a series of photographs of himself looking very out of place in the women's toilets. Now, this is ridiculous, clearly. Legislation designed to allay bigoted fears about, quote, men going into the ladies' toilets would lead to this guy having to go into the ladies' toilets. Because if he went into the men's, he could be arrested. Now, this is a poorly thought-out hypocrisy, clearly. However, there's a fair bit more to be said about trans men's restroom issues here. Issues I didn't really know about until I started writing this video, actually. It is easy to point to pictures of a big bearded tattooed guy in a women's restroom and say, ha ha, there you go transphobes, your hysteria about trans women has led to this situation. How silly and hypocritical of you. And that can be fun, you know pointing out hypocrisy often is. But we can find ourselves playing into a harmful narrative here, and it's one of masculinity being inherently dangerous. How we do public restrooms is often rather rubbish. There can be facilities in women's restrooms, say, places to dispose of menstrual products, or an adequate number of doored stalls for people who can't urinate standing up, uh, that often don't exist in the men's bathrooms. Women aren't the only people to menstruate, but their bathrooms are the places we as a society are expecting menstruation to be dealt with. And that puts trans men here in a very awkward and unfortunate situation. Their needs aren't being accommodated there. So, you know, it's still okay to highlight the hypocrisy, I reckon, but we should be careful to do it in a way that doesn't present masculinity as being inherently harmful. There could be completely legitimate reasons that someone who looks masculine to you could need to use a particular restroom. And this brings us to the next argument. Uh, genitals are out, I think we can all agree, so let's consider what a particular person looks like to you. We can't usually see genitals, but we can see gendered clothing, makeup, fashion choices, jewellery, hairstyles, and so on. So someone might say, okay, well, if I reckon someone looks enough like my idea of what a particular gender should look like, then they're cool to go into that gender's spaces. So you might say Michael Hughes gets to use the man's toilets because he looks like a man to me. I guess this is an example of what Philosophy Tube might call a your dad opinion right there. You know, it's an attempt at being reasonable uh, that falls apart once you start to actually think about it. You see, the big issue with this line of thinking is that it's so subjective. Each person's understanding of what a particular gender looks like is unique to them, to some extent anyway, and it also varies culture to culture and over time within those cultures. In certain places and times in history, for instance, a woman wearing trousers would be considered a ludicrous, ridiculous thing, whereas today, in the West, it's a completely normal, uninteresting thing. You know, being objective is an impossible task here. Any imagined attempt to lock in a single society-wide idea of what a particular gender looks like, 
would quickly fall afoul of changing fashions and gender roles. Denying access to gendered spaces based on what amounts to fashion choices would in effect be by proxy legislating what clothes people of particular genders are allowed to wear, which seems like kind of a step backwards there. The inescapably subjective nature of this way of determining gender doesn't just hurt trans people either. There's all kinds of folks out there with all kinds of body shapes and haircuts and fashions who shouldn't have to deal with the indignity of some random twerp deciding they don't look right and kicking up a fuss, you know, when they're just trying to use the bathroom or whatever else. And there's various news stories I could mention here. A Connecticut cis woman was mistaken for a trans woman in a Walmart bathroom and was then verbally abused. In Texas, a man followed a cis woman into the women's bathroom because according to him, she dresses like a man. You know, a, a man following a woman into the women's toilets because he's concerned about men going into the women's toilets. That makes sense, doesn't it? In Florida, of course, a cis grandmother was mistaken as trans and accidentally jailed in an all-male prison. And I say mistaken there, but it appears from reading that news story to be a case of someone being deliberately mistaken in order to hurt someone else. Sort of weaponized misgendering there, which is something we need to be concerned about happening, clearly. Now I don't want these chumps to be the ones deciding which gendered spaces other people should be using, because they're clearly terrible at it. However, if we say that judging people based on genitals comes with a ton of problems, and judging people based on appearances comes with a ton of problems, how are we supposed to determine what gender someone is with regards to them accessing gendered spaces? All our answers thus far have been flawed. Well, how about we consider, going by, uh, what they tell you they are? You know, consider respecting what you're told when someone tells you what gender they are. Now this is my actual opinion of what is both the correct and most sensible thing to do for the record, but let's have a talk about it all the same. So the question of self-identification has been discussed a fair bit in the UK of late. Uh, there was recently a consultation on possible reforms that could be made to the Gender Recognition Act of 2004. Currently, the UK legally recognises trans people as their gender if they have a gender recognition certificate, which requires a long and difficult bureaucratic process to acquire. It involves living as the gender for two years, uh, medical diagnoses for gender dysphoria, and amazingly, for someone who's married, a spousal approval. So it seems sensible to want to maybe streamline this process a little bit, Make it like changing your name or something like that, you know. That's something we should all have the right to determine ourselves, after all. You pay a small fee. Hopefully small, anyway. Uh, you file a thing with a court, you wait a minute, and there you go, you've got a new name. Why shouldn't changing your legal gender be at least as easy as that? You know, is there anything we need to be concerned about here? That's the segue into the concerns section of my video, folks. And for examples of said concerns, we're going to take a look at those Guardian articles here. First off, on the 14th of October of last year, The Guardian published an article titled Women's Groups Claim Silencing on Transgender Concerns. So here we are then. Let's read some relevant sections of this article and get at those concerns. Nearly 200 prominent figures have signed an open letter raising concerns that public and private bodies are helping close down discussion about government plans to make it easier for trans people to have their preferred gender legally recognised. A government consultation on reforming the 2004 Gender Recognition Act closes at the end of the week. When she launched it last month, the Minister for Women and Equalities, Penny Mordaunt, said the government particularly wanted to hear from women's groups who we know have expressed some concerns about the implications of our proposals. But according to the letter's signatories, there have been a series of attempts to close down discussion among women about GRA reform. Those campaigning for greater transgender rights say that the reforms to the Act are long overdue. But Woman's Place UK has a number of concerns, including how they might affect women-only spaces. The group calls for a respectful and evidence-based discussion about the impact of the proposed changes. So, okay, this article, despite having transgender concerns in the title and mentioning them several times, doesn't actually contain any of those concerns. It just alludes to the fact that there are concerns that exist, without saying exactly what they are. And this should be a red flag. Uh, but let's leave that there for a moment and move on to the next article, from the 17th of October, uh, three days after the previous article. 
And this is, transgender law reform has overlooked women's rights, say MPs, so perhaps we'll find our concerns in here. Senior MPs have called on the government to reconsider plans to make it easier for trans people to have their preferred gender legally recognised to ensure the reforms are not detrimental to women's rights. Detrimental how, you might be wondering? Well, this article doesn't say. The MP for Luz, who sat on the inquiry, said she was writing to the Minister for Women and Equalities, Penny Morden, to ask her to extend the consultation on the Gender Recognition Act to ensure that women's voices were heard. What were those women's voices saying? Something, presumably, but we're not going to say here. She said MPs should have more time to assess the concerns of women's groups about the changes, such as how they might affect women-only spaces. And how exactly are they going to affect the women-only spaces? Again, we're not going to say. I think it's a fair comment that women's groups do not feel that they've had their voice heard. And what are they saying, though? We don't know. Do you see the pattern here? Nowhere in either of these articles, which are not news articles, by the way, they're proxy opinion pieces written by transphobes using The Guardian as a mouthpiece, nowhere in these articles are these supposedly very important concerns just, like, said. These are articles about the fact that concerns exist that don't mention what they are, and we have to wonder why not. You know, if I had a lot of very important concerns and also the ear of a national newspaper, I'd be using that platform to get those concerns out there. You know, nobody will let me express my concerns, I said to the reporter who reported it in the national newspaper. This doesn't make sense on the surface. Now, spoilers, uh, the truth is their concerns are a load of hateful shite and make them look like bigots, so instead of arguing those concerns, they just repeatedly state that there are concerns that exist, which by virtue of being completely indistinct are therefore possibly valid. You know, you can't get proven wrong if you never actually say what you think, taps forehead. This is a tactic used to slow down discussions and ensure they're as drawn out and unproductive as possible. You know, I've got concerns about desegregation. I've got concerns about marriage equality. I've got concerns about trans people. What are those concerns? Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? And I'd rather not say, honestly. All that matters is that I have concerns and that you get told about that constantly. And if you get sick of my bullshit time-wasting tactics and tell me to shut up, well, you're harassing me. Just for having possibly legitimate concerns. And you know, I was just about to say my concerns as well, but then I got harassed. And now the conversation is about how toxic the conversation has become. That should kill 15 minutes. Filibuster bigotry, this is. Now, the closest The Guardian comes to stating an actual concern comes in the When Rights Collide article that earned them a scolding from their US colleagues. And it's where they say, Women's concerns about sharing dormitories or changing rooms with male-bodied people must be taken seriously. These are not just questions of safety, but of dignity and fairness. Again, what the actual concern is here is fairly indistinct, but it seems to be that if women, and read cis women there, of course, are forced to share spaces with what are described here as male-bodied people, then something unsafe or undignified or unfair will happen. And there's a fair bit to talk about here. Uh, first off, though The Guardian puts quotation marks around the term male-bodied, they're not actually quoting a real person or organisation here, they're just trying to say it without saying it, you know. We wouldn't say this, of course, but a hypothetical concerned woman we just made up might say it, and she must be taken seriously. This concern has at its root the belief that men are naturally and intrinsically dangerous, and also the belief that trans women aren't really women and are in fact men, and therefore are dangerous. These opinions are just being expressed here in language which is being gauged as more socially acceptable than just stating it outright. The rights of cis women are being ranked as more important than the rights of trans women here. Because someone might be concerned that something unsafe may occur if trans women share spaces with cis women, that's apparently enough justification to engage in collective punishment of all trans women by denying them access to the spaces and services they need. And not just trans women, but other trans people too, who exist, you know. Now, The Guardian dodges around discussing the rights of trans men in particular with the following sentence in brackets. 
The rights of trans men are far less controversial because they do not, while transitioning, gain access to spaces designed to protect a disadvantaged group. And trans men are not mentioned again in the article. Now, this is a terrible oversight, because trans men's rights and trans women's rights are not entirely separate entities. It doesn't matter how controversial or not The Guardian has decided that the rights of trans men are. They will be equally affected by any proposed changes to laws relating to gender identity. Also, there's something else to be mentioned here. The Guardian article mainly talks about trans women, and only mentions trans men in that rather dismissive aside, but it doesn't consider other trans people. It's enforcing a binary system there, a trans binary system, to reflect a cis binary system. However, for example, there are non-binary people, some of whom consider themselves trans and some who don't, I understand, but all of whom would also be hurt by any new law designed to hurt trans women specifically. No change to a law is going to say, trans women aren't allowed in women's spaces, but other trans and non-gender conforming people, you can do whatever you want, is it? Another concern, possibly alluded to in The Guardian with the phrase questions of safety there, is the idea that if we allow people to legally self-identify their gender, certain cis men will start deceptively declaring themselves trans in order to go into women's spaces, and then go on to sexually harass or assault someone or something. It means any man who says he is a woman can enter a woman's locker room, dressing room, or bathroom at any time even convicted sex offenders. And I've seen this brought up a few times in conversations about bathroom bills in the States, and it's never made much sense to me. Firstly, there are already laws against harassing or assaulting someone, and I doubt that any criminal who is willing to risk breaking those is going to be all that put off by the comparatively minor crime of using the wrong bathroom. It doesn't seem very realistic, does it? Secondly, even if there was a creepy guy planning to use gender identity deceptively in order to access women's spaces, he could do so no matter what the laws relating to gender identity actually were. Consider a society which determines access to gendered spaces by genitals, for instance. A creepy cis guy there could simply go into the women's bathroom and say, hey, I'm a trans man. I don't want to be in here, but the law says I have to be in here, because I was born with a vagina. Again, unless you're planning to have a doctor checking medical records posted outside the door of every toilet, there will be no way to know. Also, we don't even have to consider trans people at all here. We can simply imagine a cis man who declares himself to not be a trans woman, but a cis woman, and then going into a woman's restroom and doing whatever creepy thing. That is a possibility regardless of what the laws are. Not that anyone who is sneaking into toilets to do creepy things is concerned about breaking laws either way, of course. You know, any extra used the wrong bathroom charge is going to appear inconsequential next to the charge for whatever creepy thing they were doing that got them arrested in the first place. So considering all that, I don't think this concern makes much sense personally. The theoretical possibility of someone being harmed is being used here as a tactic to halt action even though the way in which they would be harmed is already illegal and entirely possible regardless of any proposed changes to the law. And we can counter it by hypothesizing the opposite. Consider a trans woman who is prevented from entering a gendered space, like a woman's shelter or something, and then suffers abuse or harm because of that. That's entirely possible, isn't it? And it seems a lot more likely than our imagined creepy trickster, to be honest. I'd like to consider a variant of the trolley problem here. We all know that, right? Uh, there's a runaway trolley moving towards some people tied up on the tracks. You're standing next to a lever that can divert the train onto a track with one person on it. Do you pull the lever? And then follows a philosophical conversation about one's responsibility to reduce harm, and so on. So, here's my variant. Uh, consider a trolley that's moving towards some people tied up on the tracks. You're standing next to a lever that can divert the train onto an empty track, with no one on it. Now, pulling the lever seems like the sensible option, obviously. However, before you can pull the lever, someone comes up to you and says, Hold up there a second. I've got some concerns about your course of action. What if we divert the train onto the empty track, but then afterwards, down the line, a murderer pushes someone in front of it? Now, that is a possibility there. 
that's a theoretical possibility of harm as an indirect result of your actions to some extent, no matter how well-intentioned your actions were. Now, this concerned citizen would say, I have nothing against those people tied up on the tracks. I don't want them hurt, I just want to have a conversation. I want to make sure we fully consider all options here. I want to ensure all voices are listened to. Every concern must be heard. You know, at which point the trolley has long run over the people on the other track because of their delaying tactics. You can't stop the trolley of reality. Delaying or even rolling back trans rights ensures people are definitely going to get hurt and they're real, not theoretical people who will definitely, not maybe, be hurt by a direct, not indirect, result of your actions because of you, not an imagined, ill-intentioned criminal we had to cynically invent in order to make the logical and sensible cause of action seem more dangerous than it actually is. So, it's about time for me to wrap up here, but I'd like to mention a few things before I go. Uh, firstly, what we've done today is not, I feel I should mention, prove trans people are valid by some sort of logical process. The purpose of going through these arguments was to prove that the arguments were flawed, not to pass some sort of moral judgement. You should respect trans people even if you disagree with everything I've said today. So, there's that. And next up, I've avoided talking about what lies behind all of the delaying tactics, concern trolling, and vague euphemisms, and that's outright hateful bigotry, which exists and is happening. Beyond the day-to-day, -day, individual level harassment that trans people have to deal with, there are organised groups working on campaigns aimed at making their lives harder on a larger scale. In Liverpool, where I live, there was a campaign to put up a bunch of penis stickers for some reason. Images were also shared on Twitter of these stickers being put on the sign for a Scottish feminist organisation, uh, Topshop, for some reason, and also above the sign for Stonewall, which is an LGBT charity with the slogan, Acceptance Without Exception, and that's a revealing contrast of slogans there. The transphobe community in the UK has recently found something of a champion in TV comedy writer Graham Linehan, who I won't dwell on personally here because he frankly isn't worth the time. Uh, I mention him only because he provides a good example of how organised transphobic hatred in the UK can have real damaging effects. There's a UK charity called Mermaids that, among other things, provides support for young trans people and their families. It does important work and was recognised for that recently by being awarded a grant from the UK's Big Lottery Fund. Now, Graham Linehan wasn't too happy about that, apparently, because he took to Mumsnet to complain about it and encouraged that community to write to the Big Lottery Fund in an effort to have their grant rescinded. In response to this, the Big Lottery Fund decided to undertake a review of the grant, and it's unclear at this time whether the Mermaid's grant will still be awarded, though I, of course, hope it will be. Now, this sort of terrible thing, you know, campaigning to defund a children's charity, is what lies behind all of the bullshit concern trolling. And speaking just as a UK resident, I guess, I am disgusted that this sort of thing is going on in my country. It's shameful, completely. With that in mind, and also because I'm uncomfortable with the idea of solely benefiting financially from talking about trans issues as a cis man, I'm going to be donating half of the proceeds from this video to Mermaids. I'll be making that donation in around four weeks' time in early February, once everything's been processed and I can get an exact amount for how much this video made. I'll also put a link to their website below if you feel like donating yourself, to spite all of those horrible people trying to get their funding pulled. And also to help the kids, I guess. So best case scenario is, Mermaids hopefully still get the grant, and they also get a little extra on top from us. Let's show all the transphobes out there that we are capable of caring more than they do. Thanks a lot for watching, folks, and thank you in particular today to the kind people who proofread this script for me and provided very useful notes. If I said anything clever in here at all, you can probably safely assume it was a suggestion from one of them. 
Thanks, as always, to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Uh, now then, there was a bit of an issue with the credits of the first version of this video. Um, I usually release an early version of a video for patrons, you see. Uh, anyway, the credits were messed up on that one, and we left some people out. Now, hopefully that issue has been fixed for this version, and everyone who should be in the credits uh, should now be in the credits. Uh, so, crisis averted, hopefully. And if you'd like to check out my Patreon and possibly be witness to future errors I make, I'll put a link below. Uh, there's also links to my Twitter and Curious Cat accounts if you'd like to give me a follow or ask me a question. Uh, Rightio folks, I'll see you next time.